Hi guys, I'm Tara Lipinski. And this is Todd Kapastashi. And you're listening to the 18th <laughs> episode of Unexpected. Oh, still numbering them. We're, yep, we're going to continue thought that. we were going to stop that <laughs> after last week. No, keep it going. Okay, fine. Um, so I'm wearing a hat today. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you're just listening. Oh my gosh, just we're filling talking. you in. The, the wardrobe... Well, no, but and a hat. Todd Kapastashi. We've done 17 episodes and I've never worn a hat. And it, what's funny is actually my friend JB will get a kick out of this because, you know, again, we've talked about this at nauseum <laughs> on the podcast, but. About your wardrobe? Yes. Yeah, it's just very basic. <laughs> so like whenever he sees me and I have like a backwards hat on, I'm wearing my hat backwards. He'll be like, oh, wow. Like hip college Todd. Or I like he's shocked is. by a backwards I have a, a thing hat. with hats. I've always loved hats on guys. I love this is also reminding me of a funny story that we have to tell everyone, but I love a backwards baseball cap on a guy. I don't know what it is. First of all, meaning you, first of all, <laughs> this is so this, I know this is what this podcast is supposed to be about, but I know, I guess it's a relationship podcast in a yeah. way like women out there. Don't say things like that. <laughs> I feel like you say you. that I a lot. You. I, you know what I? No, you don't. I honestly, it means statement. that whenever you had a boyfriend, you liked when he wore a backwards hat. I don't want to hear about that. Okay, can we talk about real quick? <laughs> you know we... what I like when girls wear spandex <laughs> pants at the gym. Spandex. <laughs> no girl wears spandex. I love Lulu Lemons on my girlfriends <laughs> or on my wife. <laughs> like, what are you saying? Wait, can we talk about what is the name of the store? Faraday. <laughs> Should we tell that story? <laughs> okay, guys, let me preface. Now I'm prefacing like you. Todd likes to really exaggerate gotta start, We really got to start talking about these podcasts ahead of time so I can prep my responses yeah. for some of these things. Wait, but I'm just prefacing that Todd really likes to exaggerate <laughs> things like that story right here about me walking around the house. Everyone's going to think, oh, my God, Tara's walking around the house saying what she thinks is hot on other guys. <laughs> that's not the case. But. Let's talk about this because this is another exaggeration that's become an inside joke between us. Yeah, we were walking by. So Faraday is a store. It's honestly, I hate, I don't want to disparage it. It's actually, the clothing is nice. Yeah, I like but it. But it really is an updated version of like Abercrombie and Fitch kind of. It's like this kind of corny, <laughs> like Southern I, store. It's nice clothing, I'll I say. Like but it. it's really, it's kind of expensive and whatever. But okay. people know probably Faraday out there. So we walk by, we're on like a vacation or something. We walk by a Faraday store and Tara literally... <laughs> Literally looks at me and says, "Oh, like I've seen a bunch of hot guys on wait, Instagram wait, wait, wait. wearing Faraday. We should go in there and look okay. for you." I'm like, "Hot guys that on Instagram right. wearing Faraday? Like, <laughs> okay. what are you saying to guys, me?" Guys, okay, Todd, <laughs> a lie detector is on you right now. Was the word "hot" ever in my I think sentence? You said so no, no, no. Okay. All I said is I've seen a lot of guys on Instagram because you know how you get these ads. Like, I've seen a lot of guys wearing. Faraday. There was an insinuation. This is what I'll the, say. The, but, but every time I retell the story now, it is like the you hot exaggerate. Guy. Yeah, I exaggerate yeah. it. But like exaggerize, <laughs> exaggerate. Go on. Exaggerize could be a word. <laughs> um, you did insinuate though, in some way, and I can't remember. This was now a year ago. No, nope, but you I... insinuated that you thought these guys look so great in this Faraday clothing. No, there was an insinuation no, no. of like maybe you could look as hot as the wait. Faraday models. So the best part of the podcast is getting. When I'm scrolling Instagram and I look at all these accounts with hot guys, they seem to be wearing Faraday. Never, maybe we should pop guys, in there. Never said this. This is my favorite thing about <laughs> Todd and when he does these things. And <laughs> what I like is last week people like we talked about commenting on the podcast and a lot of people are commenting and I read every single one and I feel like I'm going to get a lot of backup in this area and they're going to realize through our podcast Todd that he is a cancer you Georgie's a Libra I'm a Gemini oh and you are <laughs> he also does not believe in astrology <laughs> <laughs> but oh, you man. are sensitive to certain things and I think when you heard me say oh I've seen a lot of guys wearing Faraday on Instagram let's go stop in and see if there's anything for you you heard it slightly different people should do <laughs> We should do like a social experiment across the country where people just like make up any astrology sign that's not their own and be like, oh, I'm this. And then listen to the people be like, oh, my God, <laughs> you are definitely a Libra. And then be like, oh, no, actually, I'm a Sagittarius. I, I'm just lying because that's all people do is they in their mind somehow they they hear your sign and then they just assign the things that like 
somehow fit that sign that you may or may not possess. I, and I, I just I, I'm it, not like a it's huge my biggest pet peeve is astrology, astrology person. Not huge, but I am. I love it because it's fun. So <laughs> I know, fine. you know, that's fine. But, but I do see similarities, and I and I don't know why they're there, but they are. Okay, it's we can talk so, about astrology. No, I, I want to talk more about it because okay. it's what it, it, <laughs> Todd it's fired. So, up. I, I actually am because I just find it to be so irritating. Oh, oh, she's a cancer. Oh my gosh, is she but a you cancer? Are, and am I am I not a Gemini? I, 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 w- I wouldn't be able to tell you. I don't know. I bet, I bet everyone if who I has watched at, us will attest after if just I, getting to know me. What's I another pro- sign? Uh, Well, Georgie's a Libra. If I looked at Libras, I'm sure I could find characteristics of you in a Libra if I really wanted to. Mm, and then I could well, easily be like, oh, know. man, Tara. Maybe we'll do some She sure experiment. is a Libra. Okay, guys, we'll do some experiment. Todd and I will do it one date night at home while we're drinking wine of the characteristics of a Cancer and Gemini. And we'll honestly see... If they match up and Pe- then we'll report back. People also need to do, do more like academic research into like what retrograde means and the tides, because I promise well, you, if Mer- you really I, research be- the science of uh-huh. it, it's not what you think. Well, and you're just Mercury a- retrograde. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> oh, it feels very real. You know, somehow we've managed <laughs> to stay married and get married in the first place with a lot of like Different. opposing <laughs> views on this stuff. We're a case study for how to make this work. Opposites attract. <laughs> No, but I actually, I, it, I get yes being serious. I get the fun of it, yeah. and I'm sure there are. Uh, actually, I'm not sure there <laughs> if there's are, any there science are. behind there is, it. So there's, there's not something but, behind it. Okay, there's we'll something get into behind it later. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I wanted to say before we actually got going with the podcast that I that struck me kind of this morning when I, I was like, oh, we're gonna record a podcast today, is I don't know how you feel about this. The the way in which I feel the day of, and even after recording a podcast now versus like when we used to Uh. is so different. It's like, there I say like again, that's one (laughs) for them. I'm sure I've said it 12 times already, but that's one I noticed. Um, It, when we used to record the podcast, obviously the topics were a lot heavier. Like I would wake up and be like, okay, I think we're going to record a podcast today and we're going to talk about Tara's second miscarriage. And Mm -hmm. man, this is going to be like a long whatever it is an hour or an hour and a half and i don't know there was like a air in the house i almost think before like the days we were recording and then like beforehand it's almost like i was it was almost like we were going on television i know that sounds really weird but i was like and the set downstairs was like bigger and different but i would feel this like anxiety and nervousness and then when we're done i'd feel this massive sense of like relief afterward whereas these and not to say we don't we certainly care about these things and we talk about some of the things we're going to talk about and, you know, taking it seriously. It's just, there was something different about the way. Well, it was just heavy material. Yeah. And I think even I would feel that way. Sometimes I would get really into my, you know, I'm very emotional, but I would just, you know, even before the podcast, like listen to music that would make me cry. And I would think, why am I crying? And then it was, it was preparing me. I knew I was crying because I was already thinking about the sub subject material that we were going to talk about that day. Yeah, so. I mean, some of those episodes I would have like this euphoric feeling when we were done. I'm sure you get that on te- television yeah. too when you're like nervous all day and then you do like live TV and then you're done and it's like this feeling of relief. And well, I even get that like with work stuff when yeah, I'm like live fun. on a set and filming when something. Then when, something. It's, <laughs> when I'm done with it, it's like, oh God, thank yeah. God. And I just... It, I, I don't know. I this guess the, is, this, the observation is just that the, this podcast feels like I'm excited to do it and it's f- more fun. And well, yeah, I don't nobody know. wants to talk. Yeah, <laughs> nobody wants to talk about four miscarriages, four DNC. Like, but I think it just speaks to the fact of like how hard. I don't know. Give ourselves a little pat on the back, especially you for like for 15 episodes talking about all this stuff because it does like even looking we haven't reflected really me and you personally it's not like over dinner we've been like let's talk about what well, that we were 15 digging, episodes yeah, were like right. and we really haven't unpacked like what that experience was like because just so people know like that's it's something we got into last week i guess a little bit of some of the criticisms it's like if people only knew like this was very hard <laughs> not just technically of just like doing this on our own but just Having you, not for me really, honestly, but for you to like go to these places. Well, it was like A, every week. emotional, and B, it was digging up things that I realized probably, and this is maybe a therapist could answer this, but I feel like 
without even knowing it subconsciously, I was packing things away deep in my my soul to never think about again. And then when you're prompting me with questions that I don't know are coming, I just remember thinking like, feeling like a physical reaction to having to think about that memory. So it is hard to go back and, you know, dig up, dig up all those awful memories. And I think that goes to, an. I mean, I, we've, we've mentioned it before, but just, I think, think infertility stays with you. The effects of infertility. Infertility maybe changes when you become pregnant or like us, we now have a child, but I think the trauma of it just is in your body somewhere and hopefully healing, but it's there. Yeah. And it almost feels weird that we've like moved. You almost, we've talked about the guilt associated with like moving on a little bit. Like we might have a second or third kid and have issues too, but at least right now we're kind of like past that really difficult time in our life. So it's it's almost hard to say like, oh God, that podcast was so hard. And now this one's easy and fun because, but it, it is a little bit. Well, I think we are talking more general topics now and um, where we were going back into time and having to relive, you know, a time that was really full of trauma for the both of us, our relationship, our life, our family's life, everything revolved around loss and sadness. So now we're talking about these topics and touching on them for two minutes instead of an yeah. hour and a half. Well, also, I think during the podcast, which I didn't actually expect, we really did touch on a lot of stuff we had never talked about personally. That's so I, I think people out there, I hope they... You know, because a lot of stuff in like TV media is like very contrived. And right. I'm not saying we didn't discuss any of what we discussed on the podcast. Of course, we like I mapped a lot of the stuff right. out just timeline wise. And we talked about like because you had to educate me on certain things, too, that I forgot or stuff I just didn't understand, right. like even how to ask that question. So we right. certainly talked about stuff. But most of the podcast was just us talking and, and stuff came up and even our relationship, things that we hadn't unpacked Packed. yet kind of came up. So. I mean, what's interesting to your point of feeling relief and excited, I don't know if I feel <laughs> that same feeling as you do. I under, I can relate to not having to go back and relive moments and that feels like a relief, but I think just our personality differences, I... I am thinking about this second journey and even from last week to this week, we are talking about it a lot more. We're timing it out. We are moving forward with this and I almost feel anxiety when I am relaxed right now talking about it because I think, oh my goodness, this is the innocent, things could go right like they did with Georgie and I'm saying that, but actually I know way better. I know everything that can go wrong and it's giving me a little anxiety to yeah, but talk it, about it be but because does, I'm scared of what our second journey could look like. But doesn't it make you feel better that we've already gotten, you know, it's almost like the first three years of our journey, like figuring out issues and getting embryos and doing all these retrievals. Yeah, like that's definitely over. Well, I mean, you know, I, would, I, I mean, if we lose the you, amount of embryos we have left, then man, we are like pretty unlucky. I know, but I, I feel that way. I, that's why I want to move so quickly because I still would have time to possibly do another retrieval, which, oh my goodness, I, I can't even imagine saying that because that means we would have to lose so many embryos. Yeah. But we lost so many embryos. I don't feel comfortable. Well, interesting that you say that because you didn't know I was going to ask you that. Oh no, so what are you blow asking? Blow up your spot here, but perfect segue that uh -oh. I didn't know was going to come. Oh goodness. Now I'm like I'm wondering what An it is. An interesting little thing here to to, what? to ask you. So Tara again, we you'll randomly throughout the week or the day, like just text me things like, oh, maybe we talked about this on the podcast. Yeah. Like you'll just shoot yeah. me notes. This was one note and I'm going to read it for everyone. Wait. Just listen. <laughs> she said. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's strange not doing cycles anymore. You get addicted to the highs and lows and the possibility of new life forming. So I miss that a little or I feel sort of useless. So I guess that is insinuating that you like miss part of the fertility journey. And when I, okay. I read that, I was kind of like, 
Oh, you motherfucker. <laughs> Do not say you miss anything. No, no, from- no. I, so you put, again, you're putting words in my mouth. I never said. I read that. I, did I say I miss? Oh, let me reread it. New life forming. So I miss that a little. You said no, that, that, that not that I miss the life forming part, the life of, it. Forming part it. of it. Okay. I miss. And it's interesting because the thought of doing a retrieval or a cycle or going back to the clinic makes my stomach churn. So it's a, it's obviously having two different feelings at once. But what I feel is that for five years, and I think almost every month, we, I don't think there was really any month we took off without a plan, without moving forward with a retrieval, with a surgery, with a transfer or a pregnancy. Uh, I felt like I was working hard to produce a possible life, whether it was to stay pregnant or to create an embryo. And there are these highs and lows. It was gambling every time. But I will say, and we lost (laughs) most of the time. Lost a lot of hands. We (laughs) lost a lot of hands. But those hands where we would get an embryo or a couple of, like the high you get off of realizing, you know, just A, the insurance of that embryo, that's potential life. That one of, like we made Georgie last, what was it? Last December, we found out that we had Georgie. That, and I it, bought that, this hat that day. You did. And I got <laughs> a pink one because we knew all yeah. the genders. And I'm telling you, that feeling is, is incredible because you go through hell and then your body works for you for one damn minute and then you have potential life. And I think the reason I feel that coincides with – because. This is actually very complex, my answer, but it coincides with the fact that I have a fear of losing embryos because I lost so many. So that's where I feel useless because I'm scared. I'm scared we're going to lose our other embryos. So I am I feel like I should be doing something to counteract that. And that's one thing. But then on the other hand, I also don't want too many embryos we don't use because I think about that often. I think about these embryos that we won't use and it makes me sad and I know we could donate them to science. We can donate them in general, but there's, I mean, there's a whole conversation to be had about, you know, what people want to do with their embryos, but I'm afraid of losing them and being left with nothing again and time running out with my age. So that's why I sent you (laughs) that, that comment. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, I, I wondered what you thought. You didn't answer me, so I wondered. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was probably steaming of like, oh, so you missed this. No, now that I, I do I, not miss that. I know. That. I understand your answer, too, and that makes total sense. I mean, another thing related to that that I actually find, like, fascinating, and I don't want to say the wrong thing and, like, offend anyone in the fertility world, but we've talked about this, too, about, it's going to be, a, like, a long-prefaced question, <laughs> but just the idea I, I find fascinating in life is, like, human beings' sense of purpose you know, like we all have to find purpose. Like if you don't love your job and you don't have kids and whatever, and you're sort of like, oh, I don't, I don't like my job. And I'm like toiling around in right. life and I need kids or I need this or I need that. Like what gets you up every day and gets you excited and makes you feel like you have purpose. We're all constantly searching for that. And I think throughout our lives, we, we get different purposes mm-hmm. in a sense you know you have you go to college and that's your purpose right. is to be educated and then you go get a job and then you get you find try to find love and you get married right. and your purpose is to be a good spouse and then obviously you have children and you just you know you go through life trying to find purpose in life right. and that's a more bigger picture religious existential conversation about what you know life is but you know i i, I almost feel like i've heard you say that for a while, fertility was um, honestly your purpose. And now that you, not, I'm not saying we, you don't have that because we are going to do a second mm-hmm. and third journey, but I, again, fingers crossed, it's not going to be as complex or long as the first I one. Know. But I guess my question to you is, did you feel like a sense of loss of purpose when our journey ended? Which is weird because it's like Georgie was born. It's like what we always wanted. But that part of your life, in a certain sense, has passed. And well, I actually I, have a follow-up to this too. So I think that just coincides with that text I sent you. It it I did have a purpose to try to figure out how we could have a family. And it 
it was this intense drive every single day that I felt. And I think that just is the feeling of now I'm not doing it, doing anything to help our family. It feels like that, even though I have to remind myself we had such a horrific, unlucky journey in infertility that that's the reason I feel this feeling. You know, we do have embryos on ice, but my purpose was to secure a child for us. And it took so long to do that. So I do think I feel that sometimes where, oh my goodness, what am I doing today? <laughs> you know, I went to Dr. Beck because I'm dealing with you know, an endometrioma right now. And she, it was the day that you can kind of check your baseline. And I had a good amount of fall because I was like, Dr. Beck feels weird, not just jumping in. You, you know, should we do a retrieval? Like joke, joking, <laughs> yeah. big joke, yeah. <laughs> very huge joke there because A, I, we spend so much money, time and physical, emotional energy on these cycles that the thought of it actually makes me nauseous a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I guess the reason too, I was saying like, oh, I don't want to offend anyone or like kind of prefacing is I guess my, my second point that I just find this really interesting just about life in general is like, we talked to last week too, or in the last episode about like identity of like, you identify now as this person and there is something comforting in community. It's like, again, not yes. to get too intellectual, but it's like why people are drawn to religion, why people right. who are certain cultures or races like right. band together because you have this shared experience, shared culture, like blah, blah, blah. Um, but I guess my point or my question for you that I kind of find interesting is like what I notice about like the Instagram community is that like a lot of these people, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all, but they've almost become like influencers in their own right in that world or not influencers, but people who have crazy stories, uh, you'll show me sometimes their, their profiles and they'll have like 20,000 yes. people, 30,000 people and almost like watching their pages Again, no one wants to go through this. That person does not right. want to go through this and have to like have this page where they're talking about all this stuff. But in a way, they become a quasi figure. I hate to say like celebrity or influencer, but they become someone in that community. And I do wonder if that person had a child and was kind of like done with that part of their life, if they would feel the sense of loss of like, wow, I became like a person that no, was important there. No, because from what I see... A lot of these people that have gone through journeys similar to ours feel the same feelings that I feel, feel so connected, feel so passionate, want to help, want to connect to people that they continue that journey. And it looks different, just like ours looks different now that we have a child. Yeah, yeah but I mean, again, not to be, you were a public figure already. You're like a commentator. And I'm just saying like a lot of these people you know, probably had 20 followers on Instagram and now they have 20,000 because of trauma they went through. And right. it's just like, it's, it's it, it is interesting. And yeah. the Instagram, I mean, we talked about that, the Instagram community, the infertility Instagram community is quite large. Yeah. And now a quick word from our sponsors. The story of how Ritual came to be is quite amazing. Kat Schneider, who built this incredible company while pregnant, did so because she couldn't find a prenatal she trusted. For me, trust is key. Personally, I wanted to know that my body was getting the care and nutrients it needed, especially during such a meaningful time in my life. When I found the Essential for Women prenatal, I knew this was the prenatal for me. I felt confident and comfortable that I was nourishing my body and preparing it for pregnancy in the best way possible. This made the process of choosing a prenatal stress-free. The Essential for Women prenatal is vegan, bioavailable, and clinically studied. And I love that their citrus or mint essence capsules are designed to be gentle on the stomach. So you can take them when you want, with or without food. That was a double win for me. So why settle for a multivitamin you're not 100% sure about? Ritual was literally built on trust. So you know it's the real deal. Ritual is offering my listeners 30% off during your first month. Visit ritual.com slash Tara to start Ritual or add Essential for Women Prenatal to your subscription today. Another thing I think we had talked about discussing on the podcast and we never got to was, you know, when two people who have used a surrogate come home, what's a benefit, obviously, is that you didn't give birth. So we're both kind of 
at least in my eyes, and you can tell me if I'm wrong and I want you to kind of answer this question, but we're at full strength hypothetically, like a couple physically, who go, physically. Yeah. People who go home, um, you know, sometimes a woman has postpartum or she's phys- maybe she had a C-section, she's breastfeeding, like all of these things that, you know, even some of my friends have made comments about like, oh, well, Tara's not breastfeeding or, oh, she's at full strength. Like you guys have not in a bad, a mean way, just in sort of like, oh, you guys are lucky that you guys are kind of mm-hmm. both at full strength. But like, is that really the case? I mean, what I guess my question is what for you coming home with Georgie, what did you feel that people might not think that you would feel or challenges that you personally? Right. Faced? I think this is an amazing question. I And I think this is just real big preface of anything in life, right? Whatever you experience, you think oh, this is so hard. This person didn't have to go through that exact same experience. So it's easier for them. And that's one thing infertility taught me is to really stop down and think about everyone's experience and how you don't know what's happening behind closed doors. You haven't walked in their shoes. So maybe it's just as hard. Maybe it isn't, but maybe there are differences you wouldn't even think about. And I think about that often. I didn't give birth. I didn't have a C-section. I didn't have a scar that, you know, is hard to move with. I, I recognize all these things and there's always degrees in different areas. So yes, that is much harder for someone who comes home with that or postpartum or, you know, anxiety, you know, postpartum, whether it's depression or anxiety, there's so many different things that can happen, but I can just give you my own experience. And for the people you know, like whoever might have said that to you that don't and that haven't lived our life. I I did not have postpartum anxiety. A, I was as emotional and we talked about this a little bit on the last episode of people that I've talked to that have used surrogates and have also carried their own children that the emotional aspect um, is the same when they came home. And I found that mind blowing because I I said, wait, but you had, you were pregnant with a child and you're saying it's the same. And that validates my feelings because I was an emotional disaster when I came home um, and I didn't give birth. (laughs) But I would just say from my perspective is since my last miscarriage and going through fertility, and I think a lot of women can relate to this that have gone through fertility treatments, how their body feels is secondary (laughs) to the pain of, of pregnancy loss or not being able to get to that end goal of a child. And they're dealing with so much change, hormones, all of these things that can result from these medications you're taking. It's so funny. You, you laugh about the shots and I think a lot of people think, oh, the shot's so hard. No, no, no. The shot is 0.10 seconds. It's what that shot does to your body afterwards. And I think for me, my body bounced back in a way from all of my cycles, meaning it was ready to go again. I didn't have any medical condition that was, you know, kept me from starting another retrieval or starting another pregnancy. And the last miscarriage, something happened. You hear me talk about it all the time. I became anemic because I was bleeding for so long. I had never felt these things that I felt after this miscarriage. Well, can you- Everything changed. Well, can you explain that to me though? Because for any men out there listening, I mean, we're cavemen. And I think especially with like women's hormones, I think, again, this is just a societal thing. Men in, again, pop culture or whatever women sort of say in our earshot, it always seems to be, and this is like a very sexist, sexist thing. It's like, oh, around their period, women get hormonal, which to cavemen, men is like, oh, they're going to be like mean and like upset easily. But like, when you say, because you've said this before, ever since that last miscarriage, my hormones haven't been the same. Even me, who I feel like an enlightened, right. <laughs> you know, intelligent enough person to kind of understand basically what that means. But like, what does that mean? And like, how could it have lingered this long? And how do you, how does well, it make yeah, you feel? Well, yeah, I mean, not to get graphic, but that last miscarriage, I bled a lot. And this happens to women too after pregnancy, but I bled consistently for weeks um, you know, not crazy, you know, not crazy, but it's, it's something that can happen. And, um, from that, then 
I, that's when we tested my iron and I, I mean, I couldn't even get from downstairs to upstairs at night and would think I am just going to sleep on the couch. The fatigue was so insane. I felt, you know, some women after miscarriages, I experienced this in a few of mine felt dizzy there. There's so many different symptoms that you can feel and the hormones are fluctuating. And for me, what happened is right after that miscarriage, I went right into a, another retrieval, which just kicked my ass. And from that, I have now my first endometrioma and that's from endometriosis. And that's, a, you know, again, all this sounds so gross, but it is a blood filled cyst in my ovary that I have. And my hormones are off from that. My estrogen's a little higher. So that means, you know, I sometimes feel these hot sweats and 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 you can there's a million reasons you can do that but all of my hormones are checked and you know it's you know people that go through menopause have these things but a lot of people going through fertility will have mimicking symptoms of this because your hormones are up and down and medications are causing that but for me this endometrioma has been really difficult it affects your period it affects the way your period presents it's painful it is so painful when i just go to the bathroom to pee, it hurts, you know, because there is a big cyst in my ovary. And it's like the other day I was like, Todd, I, I feel like I'm going to pass out from this pain. And then I have endo and people that experience endo pain just randomly. I'm in a lot of pain, whether it's cramping or uncom this uncomfortable pressure. So long story short, I am experiencing all of these things and they all started after my last miscarriage. Um, and so when I came home, I actually had that thought where I was in so much pain from this endometrioma and I've been going to see Dr. Beck to keep an eye on it and check on it. And they almost put me on medicine to try to help me through it. I almost wanted to see if Dr. Najat could somehow magically squeeze me in for a surgery, but then I knew I wasn't going to be able to pick up the baby. And I said, I'm going to push through the pain. So it's just interesting is yes, I didn't have a normal pregnancy. I didn't give birth, but simultaneously this happened to me and I've been in a lot of pain and dealing with that, even with Georgie, sometimes I notice that it, it affects me. But I think more than that, the anxiety I came home with, with Georgie from our journey affected me as well. So, you know, I would say for, for people that have gone through surrogacy, yes, they're physically maybe, you know, hopefully they're at a different capacity than if you just give birth. There is just no way around that. But you don't know an individual's circumstances, what they're emotionally going through, psychologically going through, other medical conditions that they may have that affect what those first few weeks are like at home. But yeah. I do think, and that's a whole nother subject about what women go through after they give birth. I have friends and how that affects, you know, how your body, you don't feel comfortable in your body and and your body changes so much. And on top of that, you're trying to breastfeed and maybe that's not working. And then you're taking care of a baby and there's gender roles and how partners can be more supportive during those times. That's a whole nother conversation. And even though I haven't given birth, I have friends that, you know, I hear these, these stories about. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, if possible, talk about Georgie just a little bit. So I, I guess if people want to kind of fast forward to the end, they should, um, just as kind of a trigger warning, but how has the last week been with Georgie? I would say just for me, I know, you know, it's only been a week, so there's not a ton of updates, but I do feel like the smiles. Yeah. People <laughs> say this, that they change every day. It is true. I, I mean, I would say it's like every week it feels like she's now laughing she's now like smiling and kind of reacting to things that I'm doing for the first time it is tough early on when they don't really look at you <laughs> you don't quite know if they're you know digesting anything because you know they say they can only see a few inches from their face right. and they're seeing in black and white I feel like now she feels like a, a real baby who's like looking around like digesting everything like laughing and smiling and that's like really fun the smiles it, they, they kill me they yeah. kill me so much and the little giggle now, she's even getting like a little <laughs> giggle 
And it's it's so cute. But I feel like this week she's changed a lot. And I see her, I mean, she's growing out of her newborn size to go to zero to three. And they change every day. And oh, this week I went to a mommy and me class for the first time. I didn't know how to, I talked to you about this. I didn't know how I was going to feel about this. And also I didn't know if I wanted to go, but my friends really were pushing me to go and thought it would be a good idea. You know what this reminded me of actually, which is so funny and you don't have these thoughts or feelings for like years and years and years, I feel like, but I, (laughs) you were way different than me as a kid. We've talked about this. I don't know if I should admit this on a podcast, but I was kind of like a weirdly terrified (laughs) child. Like I was scared. Like uh, during summers, I have vivid memories of my parents like dropping me off. Like at a fairly young age at like a day camp where, where there's a ton of kids and you have to like, walk up and register and then all of a sudden you're just like alone with like a bunch of people you don't know and I just you were so outgoing I was always like a more quiet kid yeah but just that feeling of I'm sure at that you know camp I went to you're sitting in a circle and yeah we were sitting in a circle and you play duck duck goose or whatever it is and like I hate like just thinking of like camp when I was like that (laughs) age is horrifying and just the way you were describing because I was like what is a mommy and me and it's like you guys sit around and you It like kind of does take you back to like the the childhood where you have to like awkwardly like meet people and become you're like forced friends almost. I love these things. See, this again, (laughs) different personalities. What you described is my worst nightmare. (laughs) Well, I didn't know if I wanted to go in the beginning because I, I, again, talking about identity, I didn't know if I would identify with these other women just because our story has been so different and how would that make me feel and, you know, all of these thoughts of, I I don't know if I fit into this group. And I also am older. So I have such a large group of friends that- What were the ages of the people there? I felt like they were- Younger? No, I I feel like, yeah, well, probably. Like, to be honest, I don't know. I feel like it was mid to late 30s and 40s. So early 40s. Yeah, I mean, it's LA. So it's Right, so it's very different. Yes, yes. Um, But I just remember thinking- you know, and this is again going into a new phase, but I have all my friends, you know, I don't, I don't need to go to this new group to connect with more people, but I realize the importance of connecting to people that are in a similar situation as you and how valuable that is. And I loved it. And, but you do, you sit in this circle and everyone's kind of shy in the beginning and I'm not shy. So, you know, the leader of the class was sort of saying like, okay, so does anyone want to share their story? And in my mind, I'm like, oh boy, you guys, I have a fucked up story to share. And you're like, hold on. It's like, you have like seven hours or actually you have like 20 hours. There's a podcast I can play for you. But I mean, it's kind of awkward, right? Because in my mind, I'm thinking like, I'm just going to tell them this kind of crazy story that they're not expecting and not just like, hi, I'm Tara and my daughter's name is Georgie. So no one said anything because I I didn't want to be the first one to jump in with that. It's kind of startling, but no one said anything for a solid. It's it's probably what you felt at camp. Everyone was just like, I don't. And I was like, hey, I'll go, guys. <laughs> let me jump. <laughs> let me jump in. Um, so I am never afraid to kind of do that. But you but what's amazing, you know what? It's just life, right? What's amazing about that is half of the group went through IVF. So it was an immediate like, ah. I went through IVF and I had to do two cycles and, oh, I actually went to your doctor and, oh, you you just connect on a different level. And it's just so nice to ask questions about your baby that you're worried about or is that normal? And three women are saying, oh, yeah, that's happening to my baby here. And it was just interesting. But it is funny. It is like it almost felt like a movie, you know, like the the leader of the group is so sweet. Like she was meant to to do this and you know she's saying let's start off with a hello song and it was, <laughs> oh, it was like hello georgie <laughs> how are you hello poppy you know <laughs> i bet she's a libra <laughs> <laughs> well that i don't like a think libra. that's a libra maybe yeah, she's well, a gemini <laughs> i'm making that up but she definitely believes in astrology that woman <laughs> but it was just really it was an interesting experience and i loved it so you're what what do you meet like weekly? We know. are gonna meet weekly and we're gonna meet weekly for I think it's eight sessions. And so you're connecting to all of these women and then you kind of talk to them after the 
the hours over and you also get, you know, we talk about sleep, sleep and feeding and it's just a nice place to get all your worries out. And also I realized you're able to, especially I've done this in the podcast now, but it's a place for women that don't have a podcast with their husband to talk about their feelings, talk about how their relationship has changed, talk about what emotions they're going through. Are you going to talk about me? At this thing? Sure. <laughs> well, you know what this just made me realize, though? I definitely though? will. I don't know how you feel about this. And maybe there. You know, we've talked so much about the support system of infertility. Like, why the hell isn't there the equivalent of that for, like, infertility? Like, would you – I guess this is a question for you that i just come up with uh-huh. on the spot. But would you have gone to, like, a outdoor support group for IVF? Or so is it such a personal so journey? It's so strange you're saying this. I have been thinking, how do I – Maybe that's another thing I start. How yeah. do I start a support group for people going through IVF? And also, you know, for me, the biggest impact of our journey was pregnancy loss. How is there something that I could start? And I don't know what that looks like. Um, maybe it's virtual or in person and then spread it out to the whole country. <laughs> because There's something about being in person that I just, I do feel like that's probably why the mommy and me's aren't are virtual in because there's a different level of, of connection connection and intimacy and just, you know, this is like with anything. Right. And I, I feel it, feel like I would love to start something for a support group for pregnancy loss. I've been on my DM talking to so many women going through various stages of a failed pregnancy right now. And there are so many questions they ask me and I realized, wow, you feel so alone. You must not have that support. You must not have that person to tell you, yes, this symptom is normal or what to expect. And I don't know. Maybe that's an, another thing that I I'm try be, to figure honestly, out. Honestly, it'd be an interesting just like test case to on your like Instagram, just be like in L.A. on Saturday at three, if you've dealt with pregnancy Race loss or, IV, or you're going through IVF. Right meet at this park and just see if people show up or, you know. Maybe I'll do that. It's probably just, what happens if I just go to the park and it's just me? Will you you come (laughs) to my circle? We'll do the podcast from there. Okay, great. (laughs) Or we'll just rehash all the stuff we've talked about so much. Okay. The last thing I wanted to ask about Georgie, which is fitting that this idiot that's (laughs) sitting at my feet now and walked into the frame again. Oh, hey. Oh, Todd and he's gets gone. so upset about his wandering <laughs> and in and gone. out. Well, Sully, this is not podcast worthy, but I've had a few dogs in my life. Uh-huh. Sullivan is unique in that he's so weird with his spots. Like, yeah. Dublin, our old dog, would like, he, I didn't even think about it. He would just like lay down next to us and yes. lay there for two yes. hours. Or if we w- walked away, he'd walk with us. Right. Sullivan has. I almost feel bad for him. He has his spots throughout the house that he rotates. So well, guys, because at night, he has anxiety. Yeah, I think it is. And I feel so bad for him at <laughs> night. Know. He will, he'll basically rotate around every, what would you say, like 45 minutes yeah. at night he, to he like five or six places. He has stations. And it's clockwork. <laughs> he literally has stations. <laughs> like the omelet bar at 7 a.m. is basically like, yes. it's so funny. At And I didn't say this at the time. He actually, he didn't understand daylight savings time. He jumped up into the bed. We had daylight savings. What was that, like yeah. two weeks ago? He jumped up on the bed at an hour later than he normally does because he, he'll do his seven o'clock station is essentially this weird <laughs> position where he puts his whole head on behind your pillow. Yes, he comes up. He'll to- come up on the bed for the first time and he like wraps his head, head. around Tara yeah. and like lays his butt like next to my head. <laughs> yes. And it's always at the same time, like clockwork at like, 6 30 maybe and he was an hour off yeah and he was an hour off during daylight savings and i like laughed to myself i'm like oh my god he didn't understand Stan, daylight that didn't saving <laughs> but he has this like cl- clockwork rotation so anyway so that's, he's that's doing that here so yeah he's like doing that right now where he's like over there he's gonna move to there <laughs> and, and then come at right my feet. back in yeah but the question was how do you think he's been with georgie i think about dublin often as he's <laughs> He's right here <laughs> as I'm pointing to the six foot painting. Um, but he's very different than Dublin would have been. He is very, very needy. And it's hurting my heart a little bit because when we talk in the baby voice to Georgie, it's his voice. Yeah, and it's you, the same voice. And you, you hear and him. you see his little head tilt and his ears and he focuses in and he doesn't understand why we're not looking at him or petting him. 
this dog will sit on me and put his paw now on like my face because he just wants the attention, which we try to give him. It's just, he wants it all the time. But it's really cute when we're doing the voice and he, at first he thinks it's him. And then I think he realizes, oh, they're yeah. like not looking at me. And then what he'll do is if Georgie's there, like on the bed, he'll get super close and like put his head, head. Like, right down by her. Yes. And I mean, tummy time. He thinks is his, yeah. the, the toys, you know. Well, I that's keep... a hard thing too with dogs is I'm sure people talk about this, but the toys rattle and they look like dog toys. So many times he'll like be up in the nursery and he'll come out of the closet with like a bunny. I'm like, Sully, so that's that, not yours, that's not, I know, I know. He's like <laughs> stealing all of her stuffed animals that I have just like in the closet. And then when you take him from him, he doesn't understand. And then you put him in the closet and he's like looking up on the shelf I at know. it. But what's so cute is he loves to be a part of everything, which I, I think is so cute. It's not, it's not like he's retreating to another place in the house, depressed and sad. He's just a goofy little boy that is saying give me attention and he wants to be when we give Georgie a bath it's a small bathroom and he wraps his his entire huge hundred pound body like in between the cabinet and my feet and lays on my feet you we go into the nursery to change Georgie he has to be right <clears throat> under the changing table with his head on my feet it he when we are in our rocking chair we have this little ottoman and he puts his head up which is like a stretch for him, but he wants to be part of it. So his head's on top of the ottoman with us. So I mean, it's definitely I, it's that really th sweet. Dublin did that. Like Dublin always wanted to be a part yes. of everything. Like he would lose his mind if like <laughs> there's people over, we're having dinner, and we had to like put him outside because yeah, he, he was doing no, something he bad. Had he to would be part lose of his mind. So it's. I mean, most dogs yeah. want to be a part of stuff. That's why they're awesome. Yeah. But, yeah. So, but it's it's cute seeing them together and and just Sully's personality of needing like yeah. attention. <laughs> yeah. Um the last thing to ask is, you know, we've been kind of talking about this the last few episodes, but next week we're kind of hopefully maybe sort of we'll see getting into it like a, a slightly different format of, you know, bringing people on and I don't know if you wanted to talk about Yeah, I don't know if week. we're going to do it every week, but we definitely are thinking about starting this and we're we're doing it with um Kristen McQuaid who I connected with obviously <laughs> my DM Instagram life. And she has had a really crazy journey herself. And she went through um, infertility for 10 years, endometriosis, you know, not to give her entire story away, but just to, to, to let you know what to expect. And all the topics will touch in her story, hysterectomy to obviously not being able to carry her own child because of that. And a surrogacy that ended at the 39 week induction as they drove to the hospital, you know, to hopefully bring home a baby, um, experience stillbirth and then went through an adoption. Um, well, don't give it all away. Come on. Okay. Like, don't give it all. some to the, okay. Uh... <laughs> so I won't. Okay. I mean, but there's so much more that but that's happened. not even all of it. That's which not is even nuts. all of yeah. it. Um, again, we won't get into it now, but, uh, I learned so much about adoption in that world and I am blown away. I, I can't even believe it, it is like what she experienced in, in any way. Um, but so she's going to be here in person and that's going to be very exciting. And I, and I think it's just going to be interesting because a lot happened in our journey, but there's so many other areas of infertility that we haven't personally experienced from donor eggs to adoption, to stillbirth, to to, to so many different things that we hopefully will connect to a lot more people out there that are listening to the podcast that want to relate to their specific journey or issue. Yeah. I think it'll be really interesting talking to her. It's going to be. Yeah. Um, so that's a wrap on what, 18? On 18. That's a wrap. Still, maybe this is the last episode. We'll no, put a number I, I started on. off, so I'm always going to say it. <laughs> well, on the next episode, I'll be wearing my finest Faraday button up and maybe I'll get my <laughs> pants tailored. Who knows? <laughs> I love you. All right. Love you. See you next week. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I'll see, I'll see you now. Well, yeah, we'll see each other. <laughs> <laughs> we met you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for listening to Unexpecting the Podcast. Please subscribe, leave a review, and follow Unexpecting Pod on Instagram for info about upcoming weekly episode releases.